If you'll please stand, I want you to take the Word of God and turn me to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, we'll find our place in verse 10 of Psalm 46. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And we've been looking at the one phrase here from verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We said this was for this stillness. It was not for your health or any other reason. It is for knowing the Lord to be still. How many of you have been thinking about being still? When you start thinking about it, you start thinking about the things in your life that's going on. And about how many distractions you get. And it kind of aggravates you because you're like, I'm not being still like I ought to be still. That's why we're talking about it. It's because I want... I want us to think about it. I want, to, I want to think about it. I want to live in this stillness. It's not just a one-time thing. It's every day we just come before God and we're still with the Lord. And um, we're going to try to answer, what does that look like in our life when we're still before the Lord? Father, help us. Help us through your word today. We can't, we can't do it. We can't get anything from today without you. And so we want to go ahead and say yes to you right now, however you speak to us, Lord. That's what we want done. Our flesh won't like it, but Lord, um, it is the right thing to do. Help us to die to self and say yes to you. This very moment, this hour, about this subject of being still in our life. We thank you for the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ shedding of his sinless blood to pay for our sins. Thank you for that. Thank you for eternal life through your son. We'll be forever grateful and indebted. We'll never be able to pay the debt back. We, we dare not try. We just love you and live for you. Would you guide us now in our minds and our hearts and help us to be still. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We've been talking about this. Of course, we went through all of Psalm 46 and, and saw what the context of this was and what's going on there. And then we started making some application um, of this and the fact that we need to pray in this stillness. We talked about what that looked like. And then you have to learn what that looks like as you pray in this stillness before God. Um, we need to handle the Word of God in this stillness. That means we need to pay attention to what we're reading, let the Lord speak to us and guide us through his word. We need to be soul winning in this stillness, and that means we're telling other people about Jesus Christ, that they might come to know him as their savior because that's their great need in their life. And, and, our, and our ability to be soul winners in this stillness is not about our ability. That's the great thing. It's about our availability. That means he can use any of us, no matter how much or how little you know, as long as you're available and he's, you're letting him guide you. We need to worship in this stillness, and we mentioned that at the beginning of the service time, and, uh, and it's got to be spirit worship, not soul worship, spirit worship. Spirit worship will lead into us uh, worshiping in our whole being, but if you're not worshiping the spirit, then you're not worshiping at all, and that's the, that's the problem we get into today in so many churches. It's an emotional service that's being run, and it's an emotional worship that's being done, and it's not according to spirit and truth. It's according to emotion. And so you can worship all day long in your soul, but never be changed because God's a spirit and we must worship him in spirit and truth. And so let's do that and be still with God. We need to think about eternity in this stillness because the Bible teaches there's a real heaven and there's a real hell and real people really go to one of these places. And that's the reason why we can be still with the Lord and think about eternity. We need to be, uh, uh, carry out the Lord's will in our life in this stillness. We talked about doing that. If the Lord leads us to do something, why don't we take time to think that thing through and then give it to the Lord and let him help us with it? We talked about, um, we started last week talking about we need to live in our home in this stillness, in our home. This is getting down to a place where everybody's like, all right, quit your meddling in your house. Now, I'm not going to come to your house and I'm not going to tell you what to do in your house. I don't have to. 
If you have the Holy Spirit, which every believer does, he can tell you what to do. And that's the reason why we're still with him. He can tell you the things in your home, in your home life, as individuals, as a group, that need to be done. And I ask this question, shouldn't our homes be a place of refuge and a peace? Should be. Should be. I think that's what needs to be, and that's what we need to try to facilitate, and that's what we need to yield to the Lord for and let Him help us to make our homes this place of refuge and peace. And there should be some kind of family schedule, I said, and everybody's schedule should line up with a family schedule. That helps with peace and not contention and everything going every way, and it, and it helps us uh, to think about other people uh, when we do that. We agree on certain things that are going to be done within our homes on a schedule, and then we are thinking about each other and giving way to each other with our schedules uh, there. Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the family as the collective body of persons who live in one house and under one head or management. A household including parents, children, and servants, and as the case may be, lodgers or boarders. And so we started talking about this stillness within our home. And oh, under a big heading, we said this. There, we need to analyze our home for things that need to be de-emphasized. De-emphasized. And we started talking about that last week. And we were looking at, if you'll go with me to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Looked at a few verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and let's, let's read, I'm going to read verse 1, verse 11, and verse 17. And the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And I said in my heart, go to now, and I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. That's what I want you to take note of, the word vanity. Uh, verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. Verse 17. Therefore I hated life because the work that is, it, that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So these things that are vanity, these things that are vexation of spirit, we need to analyze because they need to be de-emphasized. The end of Solomon's life, he's, he's thinking about these things and he comes to the conclusion that everything under the sun without the Lord was vanity and vexation of spirit. Everything we can do on this earth without God, no matter how much we get, no matter how much we do, no matter how much we help other people, it's all vanity and vexation without the Lord. And we're... We're looking at three truths here from Ecclesiastes chapter 2 that are help us in our families and we can apply to our homes. And the first truth that we looked at last week was that of entertainment in our homes. And in you know, verses 1 through 3 is where we saw that. And, of course, there's, there's a gaining of things and uh, there's laughter and there's pleasure that these verses talk about. These are, these are things that entertain you, right? You watch stuff, you laugh about it. You do stuff for pleasure. These are entertainment. And so within our home, we're thinking about the things that entertain it. What does this stillness look like when we're concerning our entertainment with technology specifically, we said? And we will become accountable first to the Lord and then to a family member. That means we're not on an island all by ourselves with everything that we do and with technology. Uh, there it can be wonderful, but it can be destructive and we'll spend less time with technology and more time with our families that's something we need to consider and then we will not wait for someone else to lead but we'll lead by example and we will be still when we're thinking about that and we'll analyze it are we using our technology in the right way the second truth that we'll look at today is is that of earthly things in our homes. Earthly things. Let's look at verse 4 through 11 here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens 
and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works of my hands, or that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Solomon was consumed with all the earthly things that he could get. Did you see all the things he talked about? He even went so far to say, I had more earthly things than anybody else before me in Jerusalem. I had most. Wow. And he said in the end of all of it, all the earthly things that the American dream is teaching you and me that we got to have more and more and more, at the end of all of it, it's just vanity and it's vexation of spirit. That's what he come down to. He said, I had everything. It's all vanity. It was empty. The flesh lied to me. The flesh said I needed this and I didn't need it. Since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, man has been longing for more things. That's what got him to begin with. Adam and Eve yielded to the fruit on the tree. I can have all this fruit in the garden, but that one, all of it's not good enough, but that one, I need all of it. And we've been doing the same ever since because most people think, how could Eve do that? And how could Adam follow her? If it wasn't Adam and Eve, you put you and your husband's name in there. Our husband put you and your wife's name in there. Because you would have wanted that one thing you couldn't have and you would have disobeyed God. And today we're doing the same thing. And you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm different than Adam and Eve. Well, no, we all have the same sin nature and because of their fall. We all have it. Yours just isn't a forbidden fruit. It's something else. And this longing that we have for more things is referred to, a dirty word, materialism. And the world's just making us that way. That's the whole thrust of Satan in this world is to make us materialistic. And we're living in a time that we can be just consumed with it. It's not always been like that because not everybody had access to things and could get things throughout history. But now almost everybody can. You can just try to hoard things and get more and more things in this materialistic mindset. And we've got to be careful to de-emphasize this within our families, in our homes. Materialism is when we not only want more things, but we actually think that the more we have, the more satisfied we will be with it, with the things that we have. When was the last time you thought you needed more and you got more and then you were satisfied? Probably no one's going to raise their hand. Because once you got that thing that you thought you needed more and you thought was going to satisfy you, you found out after some period of time, hmm, that new car doesn't satisfy me anymore. You know it doesn't smell like a new car anymore. I need another one that smells like a new car. You're just not satisfied, right? He's talking about contentment, not materialism. Materialism at first sneaks into our lives and it's the assassin that kills our contentment. All that our flesh says in materialism is more. Contentment says, I'm good with what I got. I'm good with what I've got. I want you to look at Philippians with me. Philippians chapter 4. See, you should have never asked the question, what does this stillness look like in our homes? Especially about earthly things. 
Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 11. Paul writing here to the Philippian church, he said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. There's that contentment. Whatever situation I find myself in, Paul's saying, I'm going to be content. And then he goes on and says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Meaning, I can have nothing or I can have abundantly in whatever it is in his life. Everywhere and in all things. He didn't say just in some things. Everywhere he is, in every situation, and he moved around a lot as a missionary, and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, a lot of people use that verse to apply to everything in life. If I'm a football player, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can make that touchdown because Christ is going to strengthen me. Sorry, that's not what the Bible verse is talking about. It's talking about if you lose the football game, you can still love God. And if you win it, you're not going to be a jerk. And you're going to be humble because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Okay, that's what the Bible verse is talking about. It's talking about if you don't have enough to eat, you're content. If you have abundance enough to eat, you're content. If you're in this place, you're content. If you're in that place, you're content. If you have these kids, you're content. If you don't have those kids, you're probably really content. No, I'm not talking about you kids. Uh, right? You're content. You're fine. You, you are okay with what God has given you. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He said, the reason I'm content is because I'm doing everything God wants me to do with my finances and with my life. And I know that he's going to strengthen me in whatever situation that he puts me in, that I'm going to be content in it because I'm walking in his will. And he's going to provide financially for me because I'm doing right with my finances and I'm being a good steward of what he's given me. And I have nothing to worry about. And he was talking to the Philippians that gave to him to help him on his missionary journey. And he said, God's going to supply all your needs. You just do what God wants you to do and God's going to supply your needs. You just keep doing what God wants you to do with your money. And these are two, verse 13 and verse 19, are often misrepresented from the scriptures um, when people say them. Because they usually don't tie it back to anything about being a good steward of their money. The tragic thing about materialism and our home is that it leaves us longing for more in order to be satisfied. Always. More. You know what? That's what our flesh always says. More. 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 Whatever it is. Always want more. It replaces the satisfaction that we should be looking to the Lord for with only a cheap substitute. The Lord's the one that really satisfies. We're training our children to live for earthly things, and at the same time we are teaching them not to live for the Lord. Live for things and not the Creator. That's what materialism is teaching them. Why is it that our children rejoice and are excited about getting something that is valuable, but they sigh when you walk into the church building? Oh, can I go to church again? Because it's not satisfying to them. It could be our fault as parents, or it could just be that they're rebellious against the Lord and they need the Lord, or they're not walking with them. I don't know, but they're more satisfied with the new thing that you get them than bringing them to church and giving them truth. More satisfied. Now, we've got to, we have to evaluate this in our homes because it's going to destroy us in our homes. Our families are learning to desire the comforts of materialism rather than to be, listen, uncomfortable in the will of God. Who's signing up to be uncomfortable today? Okay, nobody's signing up to be uncomfortable. Okay? But if I need to be uncomfortable doing God's will for my life, I'm signing up. But I have found out that 
a majority of the time, I'm not uncomfortable doing God's will in my life. There are some times that are uncomfortable. But you know what people are worried about? If I'm going to do the will of God for my life, he's going to send me to Africa. And I'm going to live in a hut. No AC. A lot of heat. A lot of bugs. Those big spiders. I'm going to be very uncomfortable because God's will is very uncomfortable. And he wants me to be miserable. No. That's not what he wants. We see Paul suffered a lot. Paul was unusual. Paul caused a lot of people to suffer before he got saved. And the Lord said, you're going to see for my name's sake what you're going to suffer. It was a little bit unusual situation. Not everybody's going to be like the Apostle Paul and go through the things. But everybody can have the contentment that the Apostle Paul had. And he wasn't worried about the material things of this world that he could obtain. Or he would have never followed Christ in the first place. If we were to get the, the gospel to this generation, which that's what we're responsible for, our generation, and the Lord works, and the Lord's work, and it's going to be intensified. If that's going to happen, then our desires for materialism must be put to death. And that's what's holding us back from doing what God wants us to do in our lives. Something else is taking the Lord's place in our life. Look at Matthew chapter 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6. I'm begin reading in verse 19, so if you'll read along with me here. <clears throat> materialism. Now, anytime you talk about materialism, you've got to talk about money. Because that's how you get things. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And by the way, I'm in pretty good company because Jesus is talking about this. So, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye, and if therefore thine eye be single, thy body, thy whole body, shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Okay, that's the materialism. He's about to talk about it. Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And we just read about Solomon. He had more than anybody else. And he wasn't even arrayed like the lilies of the field. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? That's the whole crux of the conversation. Your money, what you're looking at, what you're trying to get, what you're concerned about, what you're anxious about, the things of tomorrow, is because you don't have faith in the Lord. You're not trusting him with it. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things <clears throat> do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He already knows. Do you believe that? It would be good to, to consider that. 
But this is the answer. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, that's by faith, and His righteousness, by faith, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's not backwards. It's not that if we seek all these things, then we'll seek God when He provides for us. That's backwards. We seek the Lord, we seek the Lord, we seek the Lord, we seek the Lord, He provides. He knows what we need. We're seeking Him, His righteousness. He provides for us. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Why think about tomorrow? Why are you trying to take on the evils of tomorrow and the anxiety of the things of tomorrow when you just worry about today? And don't worry, just believe the Lord. Believe the Lord. Trust the Lord for that. Verse 21 tells us that where our money is, is also where our heart is. Remember reading that? Yeah, that's where your heart is, where your money is. In verse 24, it says this, No man can serve two masters, for either the one he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So where our heart is, if our money is where our heart is, then our, where our heart is is also who our master is. We're either serving God or we're serving mammon. And then in verse 30, the Bible tells us, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, ye of little faith? And so who your master is, is also where our trust is. It goes all back to our money. Money tells our son about our heart. Our heart tells us something about our master, and our master tells us who we really are trusting. You follow the line. You follow it. You look at your home. You look at the earthly things in your home. Colossians chapter 3. Please don't destroy your family and make them materialistic. We need materialist, material things. I did not say we don't need material things. But it does not need to be what our life revolves around. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, and if you're a believer, you are, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. These are these earthly things. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we must seek the Lord, and trust the Lord, and love the Lord, and hide ourselves in the Lord. That's what this verse is telling us. As believers, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just go with me there. We'll look at a couple of verses and we'll be done. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 8 and 9. This is the context here. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We can have some troubling things, some tough times, but we're not destroyed. Now look at verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. What? These troubles, these distresses, these perplexing things, these persecutions, these casting down, all this all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. So when God works in your life by His grace, then you give Him glory. All things are for your sakes. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know what's really the crux of the matter? It's your inward man. It's not your outward man. That's circumstantial. For our light affliction... Now, if anybody had affliction, it was the Apostle Paul. And for him to go and say it was light is an understatement. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now, that was true. And this was true, too. When he said light affliction, he was being honest because he was looking at heaven. He wasn't concerned about the earthly things. It's but for a moment. Work is for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but, the, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, 
Those are the earthly things. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So in the context here of being troubled and perplexed and persecuted and cast down, we find this exhortation to keep looking at eternal things. He didn't say keep looking at the earthly things. Maybe the things on earth will get a little bit better. You know, if you give more to the church, he'll just bless you more. No, it's not what he said. No, he didn't preach false doctrine. He said, keep looking to the eternal things. No matter what's going on here in the earthly things, keep looking to the eternal things. See, the devil wants to get our eyes on these earthly, temporal things so that we will not think about the heavenly and eternal things. Always, he's trying to do. I want to tell you that we need to be still and we need to long for eternal things and the ruling presence of the Lord. If we will fall in love with the things that are above, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. It's an amazing thing that takes place. And it's a spiritual thing that takes place that helps us not to be wrapped up in the earthly things. And we have to deal with these earthly things in the ruling presence of the Lord. And this is why we have to be still. Because He can show us, your life is being controlled by the earthly things. I'm not controlling your life. The Lord's speaking to you. I'm not controlling your life. Something else is controlling you. And you find out that it's something you're trusting other than the Lord that's controlling your life. And it might just be the material things of this world. And we've got to be careful in our homes because although it might not destroy you immediately, it might destroy your children when they move out. And you might not ever get them back from the grasp of materialism. Get their eyes on the Lord. Father, we need your help. The world places such an emphasis on the American dream about having and having and having. And we have all we need in you. I don't know. Lord, there might be somebody here today that doesn't know you as their Savior. And they think everything that's been said is crazy. But they have no contentment because they don't know you because they're dead spiritually. Their sins haven't been forgiven, Lord. And you're waiting for them to come to you and believe. Oh, Father, would you humble them? Would you humble all of us today? Help us to come and say yes to you where you spoke to us about. May we examine where our heart is. And who our master is and who we're really trusting in our life. And will we give it over to you, Lord, and allow you to correct us and help us where we need it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open, some already here. If you need to come, it's the time if you're visiting with us that we have an invitation. People come and pray here at the altar. You can pray at your seat. But I want to ask you if you're here today. And you're not 100% sure if you die that you're on your way to heaven. Wouldn't you like to know that today? Wouldn't you like to know that, that when you die, you're on your way to heaven? Well, the only way that can be true is not by your works, because you can never work enough. You're already a sinner, and you, the penalty for your sin is death and separation from God forever. But you need what Jesus could do for you in his perfection. In his sinlessness, he paid for you on the cross as your substitute. And he died and was buried and rose from the dead. And if you'll believe that what he did, the finished work on the cross, was enough to please the Father and to bring salvation and his righteousness to you, then you can believe on him. And you can receive him by faith as your Savior. And he'll save you. He'll save you right now because he's done everything necessary. There's no strings attached. He didn't tell you you got to do 15 things. Um, in order to help him with what he did on the cross. He just wants to forgive you, and he wants to make his relationship right with you. He makes that right. You don't make it right. If you have a concern about your soul today, would you let somebody help you? Would you let us pray with you? Encourage you today? Don't go another day without knowing that you're on your way to heaven. Jesus did everything necessary. Believers, are you pursuing earthly things? Be satisfied with the Lord. That's the end, is the Lord. Be satisfied. You have to answer this question. Where's your money at? Where's your heart at? 
Who's your master? These are questions you have to answer. Let me ask this. If everybody in your family pursued earthly things like you, what would your family look like? I'm just encouraging you once again to be still and let the Lord speak to you and have His way in your life. Be still and learn to listen to Him and want what He wants. And if you do that today, it's not going to count for the rest of your days. You'll need to do it again tomorrow and the next day. And this is a lifelong lesson that we come and we're still before the Lord and we let Him speak to us in any area of our life. We don't close any door to Him. He has everything. You might as well just give your family to God. Give your finances to Him. Give your life to Him. Give everything to Him. By the way, He'll do way better than you will with it. If you'll let Him. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brother Justin, I'm saved. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. But I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. We'd love to talk with you about that. That is something the Lord asks you to do, or commands you to do doesn't save you, but it does show something that's happened inside of you, and I'm thankful for that work that he does. But if that's the need you have, then we encourage you to follow the Lord there. Maybe you've been saved and you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, but you don't have a church home. You're looking for one, and you believe this is where the Lord's leading you to be part of Grace Baptist Church, to put your life and influence here and serve him and worship him here. Well, we'd love to talk with you about that. As a church family... We want to believe the Word of God, the whole Word of God. We want to become everything the Lord wants for us to become, and we want to uh, belong to a church family that's trying to do the same thing. And that's what we're trying to do here. So we'd love to talk with you about that, what that means. Say yes to the Lord this morning. You'll never regret saying yes to God. Father, please seal these things in our hearts as you've spoken. To your children and what we have responded back to you. Maybe there's one here today that's never followed you in baptism or, or feels your leading to be part of your church here. Um, Lord, we want, to, we want those things to be taken care of. But maybe there's one here that's not one of your children that has heard the gospel today and has realized that they have a need. And Father, I ask that they don't leave this building today without taking care of that. And you know whose heart's um, need you and you know um, your children from those who are not but I'd hate to know that someone left here today and said no to you and to eternity not knowing that they'll have another chance not knowing if they'll have another day to live and so Lord I pray that you would press um, continue to press and convict there in hearts thank you for salvation that we can know that we have we can have the witness of your Holy Spirit within uh, thank you for that. Thank you for eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. May you guide us as we go and bring us back together tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.